All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Daniel Shu. Jim Parsons. Heard yes. a lot about you. Good, bad, and different. He's been. Oh, he's been bragging on you. <laughs> bragging on you. Oh, thank you. Thank you kindly. Colonel Parsons is a. He's a true patriot, Daniel. Awful. This is a wife, non-profit. Here, get us us three, Stephen. Mm -hmm. Here, uh, Jim. One second before we start back. Stephen, will you get? Uh, hey, Colonel Parsons, will you get a? He wants to photograph with you. Oh, okay. You, no, no, no. Danny. Oh, you in the middle? All three. All three. Let's, we're gonna get the get the your sign in the back, and we would like to have a little credibility here. One, two, three. All right. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start now. Uh, very excited and honored to uh, introduce uh, my good friend and a great prosecutor in, in uh, Sebastian County, Daniel Shu. Um, he is, uh, stands for, for, he applies the law and he's willing to to uh, when the when the right case presents itself and, and a wrong's been committed, he's willing to take action. I think we don't see that with some prosecutors, uh, but uh, uh, I call him Danny. Danny has uh, always um, uh, been willing to have the discussion and have the talk, and and if action needed to be taken, always been willing to do so. Uh, and I think we need prosecutors like that. We need a little more teeth in our FOIA law. Uh, with that said, I'll present to you uh, Daniel Shue. Thank you. Uh, prosecutors are normally about as welcome as a gorilla at a lawn party picnic, but uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, again, I'm Daniel Shue, and I am the prosecuting attorney for Sebastian County, the 12th Judicial District. Can everybody hear me? All right. Uh, ignorance when voluntary is criminal and a man may be properly charged with that evil which he neglected or refused to learn how to prevent Samuel Johnson injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied by a single garment of destiny whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly dr. Martin Luther King jr. it is not the severity of punishment that deters crime, it is the certainty of it, Judge Isaac C. Parker. Uh, I love quoting, and uh, those are some very uh, uh, good quotes. All right, let's talk about the theory of crime. And uh, first, our, we'll talk about malum in se, a Latin phrase that means that which is wrong in itself. Uh, not to dive too deeply, but it's, you know, Rene Descartes and his meditations, a priori, the existence of God, cognito uger sum. It's morally wrong. Murder, kidnapping, and rape, we all agree to that easily. Then there's a separate uh, theory of justice. It's called malum prohibitum, <clears throat> that which is wrong because it's prohibited. An example of that would be speeding. Um, is speeding morally wrong? I don't know. And then applying that to FOIA, I tried to think of it, and for the most part, I would say it's malum prohibitum. However, I mean, when you have somebody habitually, they refuse to learn, uh, it may slide up into malum in se, because if it's, they're doing it knowingly, they're doing it purposely, that's a different kettle of fish. All right, why do we punish crime? And this is the same thing you look at, whether it's capital murder or FOIA. And you look, okay, why do we punish it? 
Well, first of all, a general deterrence. If it is wrong, then you need to deter everybody. And for instance, when, you, when I do a letter about a certain activity, a certain way that I am interpreting the law, it lets not only other cities know, but it lets uh, school boards know. It lets everybody know what I think the law is, and it provides guidance. It also provides deterrence. Don't cross the line and don't do that. Uh, you also have specific deterrence. If you have an entity, we'll call it City of Podunk, that constantly uh, refuses to have open meetings. Uh, they don't provide proper notice. Um, Sebastian County, I think, uniquely has a uh, history with regard to enforcing FOIA. We have actually filed a criminal charge against uh, the mayor of Hartford years ago because he habitually did not comply with FOIA, did not give the notice. It was filed, and we'll get to jurisdictions in a bit, but it was filed in district court. Uh, he was tried, he was convicted, and uh, I mean, that's, that's how the law works. Uh, but for him, it was specific deterrence. It brought home to him the wrongfulness of his conduct. Uh, rehabilitation, I think that is key. I'll talk about that more in a little bit, but we're not seeking to stuff people in jail. We're seeking to get compliance. And compliance, if they're doing it wrong, is rehabilitated. Uh, retribution, okay. Uh, that's kind of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. How, what does that have to do with FOIA? Well, I think the professor brought that out earlier. It's just like, I told you you were wrong. I made a complaint to the prosecuting attorney's office. Now he's telling you, you are wrong. So whether it results in a criminal prosecution or a warning letter, either way, there is a, a bit of retribution and hey, you, you did this to me and I can't get back at you, but others can get back at you to show you that you were wrong. Institution. Um, is just like it says, it's to, to restore the victim. Uh, I have not had a case where someone filed a criminal complaint and part of that complaint was they were seeking restitution for, for fees or any of that thing. Probably, I mean, for every wrong, the law provides a remedy. Sometimes it's civil, sometimes it's criminal, sometimes it's both. I mean, uh, if you got aggravated at me right now and conk me over the head, uh, I might sue you, but by the same token, I might go to the police, report it, and you'd be prosecuted criminally. That is an aspect of punishment that could come into play. Oopsie. That was... Uh... Okay. Now we're back. All right. Here was uh, the original uh, criminal uh, section of the FOIA, and it read, any person who willfully and knowingly violates any of the provisions of this act <coughs> shall be guilty of a misdemeanor and shall be punished by a fine of not more than $200 or 30 days in jail or both. And uh, that was amended in 1987, and it read, any person who negligently violates any of the provisions of this act shall be guilty of a misdemeanor and shall be punished by a fine of not more than $200 or 30 days in jail or both. And I really like this, or a sentence of appropriate public service or education. Then again, in uh, 2005, um, they came back, the legislature did, and just changed it to any person who neglig negligently violates any of the provisions of this chapter shall be guilty of a Class C misdemeanor and then looking at uh, 54104 and 54201, a Class C misdemeanor is punishable by fine of up to $500, imprisonment for up to 30 days or both, but that language about uh, re-education was taken out. All right, negligently, we've got to define it for purposes of the criminal code. 
A person acts negligently with respect to the attendant circumstances or result of his or her conduct when the person should be aware of a substantial and unjustifiable risk that the attendant circumstances exist or the result will occur. The risk must be of such a nature and degree that the actor's failure to perceive the risk involves a gross deviation from the standard of care that a reasonable person would observe in the actor's situation, considering the nature and purpose of the actor's conduct and the circumstances known to the actor. Obviously, mere negligence does not satisfy the statute. It would be more in the nature of gross negligence, that is, a gross deviation from the standard of care. Here's some case law. In Gill versus State, the, the risk involved must have been substantial and unjustifiable, and the failure to perceive that risk must have been a gross deviation from reasonable care. Unless a defendant has engaged in some blameworthy conduct, creating or contributing to a substantial and unjustifiable risk, he has not committed the crime. Uh, Ledwell versus State, criminal negligence is defined as a gross deviation from the standard of care considering the nature and purpose of the actor's conduct. Evidence is substantial only if it compels a conclusion without resorting to speculation or conjecture, and circumstantial evidence is substantial only if it excludes every other reasonable hypothesis other than the guilt of the accused. So the conclusion, the mental state now required is not burdensome as the original version of the act was, which was willful and knowing. Uh, the Supreme Court of Arkansas has consistently ruled that the criminal statutes are strictly construed against the state, resolving any doubts in favor of the defendant. Further, obviously the statute would likewise be violated if the person acted recklessly, knowingly, or purposely. And it provides that when a statute defining an offense provides that the acting negligently suffices to establish an element of that offense, the element is also established that the person acts purposely, knowingly, or recklessly. You can't have it from a defense attorney who says, well, you know, my client act purposely. They didn't act negligently. Well, you know, horse hockey. Uh, this statute clears that up. And to me, it goes back to that malum and say versus malum prohibitum. If you're doing this purposely, um, that's a different kettle of fish as far as punishment is concerned. Okay, purposely, a person acts, and I'm going to go through these first, and then we'll, we'll come back to this. A uh, person acts purposely with respect to his or her conduct, or as a result of his or her conduct, when it is the person's conscious object to engage in conduct of that nature, or cause the result. Knowingly, the person's conduct or the attendant circumstances when he or she is aware that his or her conduct is of that nature, or that the attendant circumstances exist, or a result of the person's conduct when he or she is aware that it is practically certain that his or her conduct will cause the result. Um, going back to purposely, I mean, that is when you intend to shoot someone and you shoot that person. That you are acting purposely. It is your conscious object to shoot them. Okay, knowingly is like if um, you shoot into a building and uh, or a residence and you had seen the person walk through the living room minutes before you are knowingly uh, killing that person uh, lastly recklessly is with respect to the attendant circumstances a result of his or her conduct when the person consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk that the attendant circumstances exist or the result will occur the risk must be of such a nature and degree that the disregard of the risk constitutes a gross deviation from the standard of care that a reasonable person would observe in the actor's situation. A classic example for that would be um, driving while intoxicated and you, again, you kill another person. You are being reckless. And we go through all this because the mechanics of filing a case in my office at least, is a citizen will come in, fill out a citizen's complaint form. I am blessed in my jurisdiction, the Sebastian County Sheriff's Office will investigate those cases. And again, that is a huge blessing for a prosecutor because I have to prove my cases beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, 
once they're investigated, it comes back to my office, then the course of action is decided. Going back to, you know, punishment and what we think may have happened. Uh, for many cases, and the, the classic example for me would be um, harassment, harassment communications, my office will send what's called a warning letter and say a complaint has been made to my office that you are calling this person all hours of the day and night, they've told you not to call, uh, that, you know, that kind of thing, and my office will send them a letter and say, cut it out. It's kind of like a cease and desist order from the prosecuting attorney. If you do this again, you're going to get arrested. And that's kind of my approach to FOIA, is I generally will send that warning letter. Uh, again, we have prosecuted, but in that case, the mayor was given plenty of warning from the office. He was given a warning letter and continued to do it. And that's, that's what the teeth of it, as uh, Joey would say, would be is it's that threat of prosecution. And again, I don't pick and choose which laws I prosecute. I, all, I'm, I took an oath to support the Constitution and laws of the state of Arkansas. So that is my, my view of it. And when you talk about, um, Joey and I were talking about the, the professor's book, it, it, it's organized very simply, and that is open records and open meetings. It's not, you look for the loopholes first. There's a, a real famous story about uh, Groucho Marx going to see W.C. Fields in the hospital. W.C. Fields was a noted atheist. And there sits W.C. Fields leafing through the Bible. And Groucho Marx says, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for loopholes. That's not the way you use this law. This law, you, you start with the, the premise that the meeting should be open and that the records should be open, in my view. All right, here's something quirky, and that's in 52206 of the Arkansas Criminal Code. It provides, it is an affirmative defense to a prosecution that the actor engaged in the conduct charged to constitute the offense, believing that the conduct did not as a matter of law, constitute an offense. If the actor acted in reliance upon an official statement of the law contained in a statute or other enactment afterward determined to be invalid or erroneous. Number two, the latest judicial decision of the highest state or federal court that has decided the matter. Or three, an official interpretation of the public servant or agency charged by law with responsibility for the interpretation or administration of law defining the offense. Well, this, oh, that did that again. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It's not liking me. Oh, we're back. Well, okay. I'll, I'll fast forward here. So sorry. That's right. All right, so here's where we were now. I mean, we've all heard this. Ignorantia lex non excusat. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. However, this statute carves out this exception. But given the Attorney General of the State of Arkansas's historic role in construing the act, subsection C seems to cover the situation which the person relies on an official Arkansas Attorney General's opinion. Uh, I would look at that and, again, depending on the facts and circumstances, consider that before filing a criminal charge. I'm not going to say it's going to deter me. It's just going to make me pause and hesitate because it's an affirmative defense. They have to prove that defense. 
Uh, oh, absolutely. an attorney general's opinion and that opinion basically says what the people in this governmental agency have done or not done it's obvious that the attorney general's opinion is in the requester's favor okay yes sir what 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 position would you take or what position should maybe a prosecuting attorney take in a situation like this would he be warranted or she be warranted to write a warning letter. In, in the case I'm referring to, the prosecuting attorney wouldn't do anything. But it's so obvious that the attorney general's opinion gave well, a, a negative reaction toward what the government was doing. You know, there's 28 them. electeds across the state, 28 elected prosecutors. Each of them, you know, that's the old saw, every dog's got his own backyard. Don't know all the facts of your case, but Usually when there's an AG's opinion right on point, I go with the AG. I mean, again, Elizabeth Walker does a fantastic job. And then I go to the Bible. I've got the professor's book. I, I, that thing is in my office. It's in my chief deputy's office. And we, we both have a copy of it. And uh, again, Linda Ward, my chief deputy, is, is very strong on FOIA. And she and I together, uh, in your hypothetical, I'm probably going to go with the AG. Well, you'll get attorneys and judges will say, well, that's just an opinion. However, because of that part of the statute, I, I tend to give deference to it because it's an affirmative defense. And uh, again, the research that she has done goes back years and years and years. And I just tend to defer to that. Um, practice pointer. I do not believe this would apply to the opinion of private counsel or government attorney just in general. Uh, let's say a, a city attorney, they, they've got an opinion and uh, you know, I will consider that, but I don't view that as an affirmative defense. However, I would anticipate in a trial setting that any official charged who had sought such advice would certainly argue they were not criminally responsible. Well, there, did that again. I guess I don't know my own strength. <laughs> that thing's been touchy all day. It is. It's not, not you. No. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad to know it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Let me keep going. I'll, I'll pick it up again. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. All right, jurisdiction. A criminal violation of the Freedom of Information Act may be filed either in circuit court or district court pursuant to 1688-101. Uh, the statute of limitations, that's very important. Uh, I have had one case that came in to me uh, literally like three days past the statute of limitations. Because it's a misdemeanor, a Class C misdemeanor, you have one year. A prosecution is commenced when the arrest warrant or other process is issued based on indictment information or other charging instrument if the arrest warrant or other process is sought to be executed without unreasonable delay. And that has been consistently interpreted as one year. A um, couple of cases, uh, DePoister versus Cole, an agency's destruction of records after receipt of a proper freedom of information request covering those materials would obviously be a denial of access and therefore a violation of the statute. Further, while imposition of the penalty when there was no pending freedom of information request would be less certain. As has been stated, the utmost caution should be exercised when destroying public records. The professor talked about that earlier. Arkansas has a statute tampering with a public record. It provides in pertinent part a person commits the offense of tampering with a public record if with purpose of impairing the verity, legibility, or availability of a public record, he or she knowingly makes a false entry or falsely alters any public record, or two, erases, obliterates, removes, destroys, or conceals a public record, and it's uh, always a felony. It's a Class D felony regardless. It's a Class C felony if it is an official court record, and lastly, it is a Class B felony, which is five to 20 years if you 
break into the courthouse to change that record. Uh, here's an Arkansas Attorney General's opinion, 2001-340. The FOIA does not contain any record retention requirements. That is, the FOIA does not state how long public records must be retained. However, the destruction of public records that have been requested under the FOIA could constitute a violation of the act which carries a criminal penalty. Uh, most often it's seven years. Uh, you can play stump the chump with me all day and ask me about this one or that one. Usually it's seven years, but I'll tell you my office because there are criminal convictions that go back on murder cases, you know, even back to the 70s, we keep them forever. Uh, Okay, Lehman versus McCord, the Supreme Court of Arkansas held that although ACA 2519-104, that's the criminal uh, section of the Freedom of Information Act, contains a criminal penalty that does not make the entire Freedom of Information Act a penal statute that's to be construed strictly. The Arkansas Freedom of Information Act as a whole is to be interpreted liberally. Uh, going back to that depositor versus coal case, the FOIA was passed wholly in the public interest and is to be liberally interpreted to the end that its praiseworthy purpose may be achieved. Uh, Saline Memorial Hospital versus Barry, the Supreme Court of Arkansas held that while the hospital and its personnel have, as does any citizen, a duty to follow the criminal provisions of the Arkansas Freedom of Information mm -hmm. Act, there is nothing to prevent its following the advice of legal counsel and weighing that duty against other legal duties it may have. The arbiter who will protect the public's interest with respect to information as to which there is a dispute is the trial court and the issues are the same as are found in any garden variety FOIA dispute. Daughtery versus Jacksonville Police Department has already been mentioned here today. The Supreme Court of Arkansas held that it is departmental policy to purge the system that maintained the audio and video recordings every 45 days. The defendant witnesses explained that this policy was based on need to maintain sufficient memory on the server. Uh, here's, this is a direct quote. There was no evidence presented by Doherty to refute this testimony. Accordingly, we cannot say that the circuit court erred in finding that the department timely complied with Doherty's third FOIA request or that the department did not violate 2519-104 and purging the records pursuant to its 45-day policy. I get to you, Joey, and it went off again. What's with that? The sun goes down when you're looking at Joey, is that it? I yeah. guess. <laughs> I was almost to the end. Almost to the end. All right. The trial court held that Arkansas Code Annotated 2519-104 was facially unconstitutional because of its vagueness and that it violates the First Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, and Fourteenth Amendment to the United States Constitution, the provisions of Article 2, Section 6, in Section 8 of the Arkansas Constitution. However, the Supreme Court of Arkansas reversed that factual determination and conclusion of law. Therefore, the criminal provisions of the Arkansas Freedom of Information Act, Freedom of Information Act remain. Question. Yeah. Do I need to go to the mic? Yeah, probably, right, since, okay. since we've got All right. folks on there. My age, if I can get there. <laughs> You may recall that uh, Jim Parsons, we met. Yes, sir. Uh, I sued Governor Huckabee because after 12 years of his being in office, he crushed all of his information. 12 years of the uh, wow. computers and so forth. Mm -hmm. How did he get away with that? I sued him, of course, I'm just a nobody, and I was facing three uh, attorney general attorneys who are there to represent state agency leaders. Yes, sir. But I wonder how in the world that sets an awful precedent because that means that any elected official, school superintendents, school boards, could go in and just erase their records 
to where they are not viable after that? How can that be? I don't see how I lost that fifth race. I don't know. Well, I don't know all the facts and circumstances of that case. Um, and uh, the question would be, was that, about, was that tampering? And you know, could that have been looked at criminally? Uh, the short answer to that is, I don't know. Um, but the jurisdiction for that would have lied with uh, Pulaski County it was. Uh, prosecuting Pulaski attorney. County prosecuting attorney. And what was his? Three hundred thousand dollars worth of computers that could have been used in schools. Public property destruction. Yes. Holy smoke! And then the twelve years of uh, history and records yeah. destroyed. Oh, I never understood that ruling. I didn't. I I, I, I'm not familiar, uh, so it's, it's a little unfair to, to parachute in on that because I don't know all the facts and circumstances. I don't know. I, w I wish I could answer your question. I, I wish so too because I was worried about that for years. Maybe a, a couple of comments on uh, uh, what you just heard from, from Danny. Uh, number one, that last... That was kind of the other story in that case. Uh, the, what happened in the trial court, they literally took every, ar the trial judge took every argument that the defendant, city of Fort Smith, made and just more or less pasted and cut it. I mean, called the entire act unconstitutional, violated First Amendment rights, the Freedom of Information Act. I mean, it was, it was to me, a bizarre ruling. Uh, and but, really not on point, was it? Yeah, it not part of the case. No, no. Because I wasn't involved in the criminal part of it. I mean, it, I don't think you came to me on that one. No, no, I, I didn't come to you on, on that particular case. The other thing I would say is that sometimes you have this dual track. Uh, the, earlier, we, I, you might recall the Bradshaw case. It was that case where our school board elected their... Mm -hmm. officers uh, through a secret email chain uh, and then uh, we FOIA'd the documents and, and it was very clear so I went to, uh, I filed a, 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 a civil suit on behalf of Miss Bradshaw and also went to uh, Danny and you know said look what are you going to do and he, he talked about a warning order, uh, I've got the letter here I mean, that's, and you talked about deterrence. That's a pretty big deterrent when you get a letter from the prosecutor saying that, uh, uh, please understand that ACA da 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 provides that any person who negligently violates this act shall be guilty of a Class C misdemeanor, it is, it, which is why Mr. McCutcheon has com, com, uh, complained to my office after reviewing the video and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I conclude, I believe that the violation of the Freedom of Information Act has occurred. Then he cites the, the case that we talked about, basically that, that the, the uh, uh, public is entitled to see the sausage being made, not just the, the end result, which is a classic example of that. You know, they did all their dirty work on the emails and then went into the public meeting, no discussion, elect their officers. And you're like, how could you elect officers without any discussion? Uh, and then, you know, the, uh, uh, Danny concluded, uh, the purpose of this letter is to try to ensure that no such further violations occur in the future. The letter shall serve as a reminder that the public's right to know must remain inviolate and that the Arkansas Freedom of Af Information Act must strictly comply with, with at all times and under all circumstances. So if you're getting that as a school board member, uh, you know, that, that sends a message. It, it, it serves a, certainly serves a deterrent effect, especially when it's combined with, with a uh, media, uh, a local newspaper who at the time uh, writes an article on it, uh, you know, that's, and we, but we've got to do these things. You don't want to do these things, but you've got to do these things uh, because if you let this pass, then it's just going to get worse and worse. Uh, and it, I, I would say sometimes, you know, it's like we're the villain. It's like we're doing something wrong by requesting records. 
by taking an action like this, and we can't feel that way. We've no. got to preserve FOIA because it strikes at the heart of liberty if we don't, in my opinion. My dad used to say, you can turn the other cheek so far, you get slapped on the neck. <laughs> right. Any other, any other uh, questions? All right. Well, let's give uh, Danny Shu a, a, a great oh. applause. Uh, appreciate you driving all that way. He no had worries. a hearing this morning and, and no then worries. made his way over, it's, and it's we really pleasure. appreciate that. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. I'm going to stick around. Okay. You good. Um, all right, we're going to now move to um, have a, a brief section on recognition of the TIG chapters, um, and that would be, uh, would that be Bob and uh, Bob Gregory and uh, Colonel Parsons? Okay. going on in our county. Uh, the, the, the third page has the other three people on it. Okay. All right. Uh, Joey, I'll, I'll put Russ's position in the closing comments to you and all together. So relax. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is just just a yeah, what's what's going on in in different counties? I think it gives folks a a understanding of kind of uh, yeah yeah very very shortly. I know it's been a been a in a, a great day, information packed day. Well, I have said before, I'm Jim Parsons, Lieutenant Colonel Jim Parsons, the uh, chapter chairman of Benton County. And uh, I live in Bella Vista, and living in Bella Vista, Cooper bought that land, he owns it, and it's like Cooperville. It is almost like the Christmas story of uh, Potterville, if you recall, to where Mr. Potter owns the town, and we danced the tune of uh, Cooper and Cooper did uh, hire an architectural control committee. They go up and down the streets, almost like the Gestapo, looking for uh, violations and so forth of their rules. And then the POA is there, and they have their rules. We became a city in 2007. They have city ordinances, so we have four layers of bureaucracy, and you've got to check with all of them before you do anything. And the thing about it is, the POA, the ACC, and Cooper are nonprofit organizations, and so you can't ask them for any records because they're not under FOIA. And if we want to know what this world would be like without FOIA, look at Bella Vista. People are moving out all the time because they have now said just one man over ACC says he doesn't like white fences. Therefore, January 1, all white fences have to come down or paint them a color approved by him. All of us are having to dance to one man's tune. That is just un-American, unacceptable, but without FOIA, this is the kind of a place we'd live in. If we can't ask questions, if we don't where our money's going, and we have no recourse to go back to see the records, that's what our world would look like. And we wouldn't want it to look like as beautiful as Bella Vista is with our hills and trees and nature. It's a wonderful place to live. Or seven lakes, seven golf courses. It's wonderful, except we do not have freedom of information. Thank you. Thank you. Who, I uh, see, Bob, are you, you want to go next? I, I do want to say a, a shout out to uh, Kenny Wallace uh, with Keep Arkansas Legal. 
Uh, he he uh, has been videotaping, Facebook streaming this session. And he'll record the information also. Uh, you know, he spends a lot of time preserving freedom uh, through videos like this and the legislature doing it for free. So we appreciate Kenny. Uh, I know we've, we've talked about Kevin and we really appreciate Kevin uh, who is um, a, a brother in arms with us. Uh, and, and I wanna say a word uh, about Colonel Parsons. You know, he's a true American patriot in all senses, a Green Beret, uh, a, a veteran, uh, 88 years old and fighting the battles, a man who has, who has filed lawsuits on his own, not a lawyer, but has filed lawsuits on, on his own behalf, has been smited down by the judge, who a judge fined him, and, and it wouldn't have happened if he had been represented, and literally charged him $10,000 for filing a lawsuit, which he had to pay out of his back pocket. And, and uh, that's commitment. That's commitment, and uh, I just just can't say uh, how much how meaningful it is to me to to know you, and you inspire all of us, uh, and and we appreciate you. Thank you for thank you. Thank you. Joey and group, thank you very much. My name is Bob Gregory. I'm from uh, Conway, and uh, I'm working with the TIG group there in uh, Conway. Inspired by uh, Bill Ray, inspired by Colonel Parsons, thank you for your uh, leadership. Uh, we have been, we being myself and my wife, our friends Elizabeth and Jack have been, Sadalaro, have been uh, watchdogging specifically county government for 10 or 12 years. That means going to every single meeting, all the committee meetings, paying attention, seeing who is in the chairs, who's, who's being elected to the quorum board and to the county offices, and understanding county government. But you can't help do that for a long period of time and not have questions about what's going on. Voila, the Freedom of Information Act. That's a way to get the information out and uh, answer questions that are difficult to find answers to. Not that people aren't being honest, not that people aren't fair and square and doing everything right, the key point that I think we're looking at all the time when it comes to a, a FOIA Information Act request is we're really questioning their judgment. We're really questioning the judgment of the people. You've made a decision in some way that has an effect on the taxpayers, which every government, every decision government makes has an impact on the taxpayer because it's all our money. Not a penny of it is their money. So all that, all the thing we're doing with the FOIA is, is really questioning their judgment and trying to get to some, some issue about it, to make a point that say, let's get that judgment, because a lot of it is just judgmental type thing, let's get that out into the public so we can see it and so more people can talk about it. I have personally been working for a long period of time with the election process to help recruit justice of the peace. That's, and county officials, that's, that's from a, from a political standpoint, whoever sits in the chair to me is very, very important. That those people have the right values, the right background, the right interests, that type of thing. Once somebody's in the chair, I'm pretty happy, I don't worry about it too much, but getting the right people in the chair, we have 13 JP districts, 13 Justice of the Peace, and there's 13 different people sitting out there. And when we started, it was very heavily one direction, uh, and now it's uh, 13 people, 11 of which ask a lot of good questions, 11 of which don't just accept what is rolled down the pike, 11 of which are very active in, uh, in the court. It turns out you have longer quorum court meetings, but guess what, you know? So what? You're gonna find out a whole lot more information. So basically I'm happy if on a particular issue there's a good discussion about it. I'm, I'm happy if that happens. How do they decide is how they decide. But if there's a good discussion about it and all the facts are out on the table that we know about, I'm a happy camper. And, and we can see what's going on. And that's, that's the, the beauty of the Freedom of Information Act, is you pull out that information and look at it. In some cases, it's rarely this morning we said that there, you can file a written re request and say you give me the information under the act, or you can pick up the phone and ask them for it. Well, once they understand that there's a written document that they have to comply with, they just comply and you can usually get the documents fairly easily. So that's that's really the way we go about it. And 
And so now we're interested in what's going on at the Quorum Court and within county government, and we're beginning to expand a little bit into what's going on with the schools. Because really all the money in the county, all the tax money collected in the county goes to the schools. The big end of it does, 80 percent, 80, 90 percent. So that's really what we're beginning to look at now, beginning to question what's going on there. So that's the, the TIG uh, group in Conway. Uh, one other comment I'll make, I don't know if I'll have a chance in a minute to make it, so I'll make it now. That is that uh, with, the, uh, with the political environments going on right now, many, many people are now finally, 10, 12, 15 years later, where everybody in this room already is. That's off the couch. You've got your good TV now because you don't have to throw rocks at it anymore. And you're out being politically active, politically active, and you're out being informed. So something different is happening right now at Republican meetings I go to, at well, our old Tea Party meetings, we call them the informed citizens meeting that happens weekly. The, the crowd is up, the people are up, and they're there, and they're very um, anxious to be educated about what can they do. What can they do to change the situation they find themselves in that they've been watching the national news or even the state news and they're concerned about it. So I think one of the functions of this group can be to somehow put an effort toward educating people that aren't educated. People that, that at least explain there is a law, you can get that information. Here's a little bit about how to do it, and that's one of the roles we'll be doing as we, as we expand our, our activities a little bit. We'll be looking to educate people that are highly motivated, highly interested, but not very knowledgeable about which direction to go. So that's, that's our effort in the future, I think. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bob, did you have, uh, and Dr. Lewis, it, did you have, I know you're on here uh, next to, regarding FOIA questions and answers. I have a list of questions and answers there, but they're very basic stuff. So. Okay. Um, should we go ahead and cover that now? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll treat the room as a group, as the panel then. Okay. So, so what I, what I, I did uh, was put together a, a few questions that um, I think might be consistent with what I just uh, mentioned. Uh, and, let, and let me just go through the questions and see if, see if this doesn't uh, generate some discussion. Uh, first of all, I said today you have heard why and how FOIA is used. And, and so questions come along like this. It's kind of like the basic when, how, why, what. When do you make a FOIA request? These are questions that if I was educating somebody about FOIA and how to use it, they've, they've got a burning issue, they want to worry about something, how do you, how do, you do that? So at what, at what time do you make a FOIA request? And then, and then of course, all those, how do you make the FOIA request, and, and all those basic questions that you have to have. But another thing is, okay, now you've made this FOIA request, what are you going to do with the results? <laughs> You've got it now, you went and got the documents, here it is, here's the, the record that you were looking for. What are you gonna do with it? Do you talk to, are you gonna write an article or paper about it? Are you gonna write a letter to the editor? Are you gonna put a, a posting on Facebook? Or what? In our TIG group, what we have, uh, several years ago, we started about five years ago, I think we started a website called FaulknerCountyReports.com. And so, Based on our activities, we generate articles and write them on there, and we try to generally write from a perspective of here's the facts, here's what we observed. Elizabeth is, is an excellent, excellent writer. So here's the article, and we, we don't say, you know, we don't try to make a judgment, we simply try to ask a question. Oh, one would wonder why this happens, or one would wonder why. So we write articles like that that expose the issues, and we've had some controversial ones. I get phone calls sometimes about why do we say that? Because it's the truth. As long as we're reporting the truth of what actually happened, you can say whatever you want. That's what happened. You got a different story, you know, that, that's it. But, so anyway, the question is, once you get the, the information on, from FOIA, how do you go ahead and do that? Social media, a special web page, which is I just told you about, maybe a PowerPoint presentation, but then you have to have somebody that's knowledgeable that you can uh, share it with. Um, talking about FOIA, how do you plan your FOIA request? The very specifically, we covered it this morning, is how do you go about, what are you looking for? What do you think is out there, what are you looking for? You have to be very careful about doing that so you get the right thing, because it's a, a big waste of time. If you do something you don't get what you're looking for, it's a, it's a waste of time. And then, and then the goals of, of now that you have it, what are you gonna do about it? Because um, you don't wanna be a FOIA busybody. Somebody talked about that, that they're just asking a lot of questions. Uh, you want to actually know what you're looking for and, and get after that. 
Another area about this is the response time. The response time required by law is three days. You have to have the answer back to you in three days. But we just made a giant uh, FOIA request. The request itself was, I think, three and a half pages. Six. And so it was a lot of material we were asking for. And <clears throat> it was to a school board. And we, uh, we, we talked to them. We got in communication with them, talked back and forth. We got, uh, first of all, initial recognition that they received it. And we sent it certified mail, so they received it. And um, had taken, taken the responsibility to answer it. And said, oh, this is going to take a long time. I said, well, okay, you can take to the end of the week. And we, but, but three days is the answer. And we drug it out a couple times, and I think in about two weeks we got it all. We got everything that we have so far, which I think is everything we've asked for. We've got to go back and confirm that. But that's the kind of thing you have to, you, three days is there, but we applied the be reasonable rule. You know, my goal is not to beat somebody up and, you know, make that, make, I don't want to make the, that the criteria for I couldn't comply because. Yeah, you've got the time. Now do it. And by the way, you're you're late. And by the way, okay, you want to charge us eight cents a page to do it? I want it electronically. I want it electronically. Ended up we got it electronically without having to pay anything for it. So so anyway, that's the that's the uh, the way we went about that. Uh, another question might be, how does the average citizen go about uh, getting advice on FOIA? We've got the Bible to read. We've got the handbook to read. Uh, that's been passed out today, but how do you get advice? You have to find somebody that, that has, has some experience with it, and that was my encouragement earlier. Everybody in this room is, is an expert on it uh, compared to the average citizen out there and can give advice or can direct somebody to somebody to give advice to how to effectively use it. Um, so, so anyway, that, I guess that's a, kind of the list the list of things I have, one other comment I'd make is that uh, if you do a FOIA request and it's ignored, or if you're told, uh, no, we're not going to give you that, and you think you have a, a, a legal FOIA request or a reasonable FOIA request, what do you do? Well, the only thing I know is that the next thing you do is you, you file a suit uh, to get that information. And I've had, we've had that experience. We filed the suit. The next day we got the information. And so, so that happened. And then the suit, the lawsuit, the, the man said he was guilty and ended up having to take a court cost. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's, the, that's the, uh, the, the types of things that we're working on, types of things we're looking at. Um, and I think everybody in this room, these, these questions are so basic that they're, every, everybody in this room can answer these questions. It's, it's a, how do we take it to the next step to the people that, that are now motivated, interested, and, uh, and looking for how can I change something that they don't like that's happening with the government. Well, that's, that's, what, we're, that's what we're about, what we're working on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Joy, Joy, comment on what George said a little bit about if they file a, an SOI request and they, and they don't get an answer, then they file suit, and then the next day they get the answer. File or rather, copy, uh, uh, comment a little bit about what's he entitled to as far as uh, attorney fees if he had an attorney, all the costs involved, a certified mail receipt, which is about six dollars and seventy-five cents, or whatever it is. Well, certainly in 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 that case, uh, you know, Bob was. We wanted to get the court costs back. Uh, I, uh, he, he paid court costs. Yeah. He paid court costs. Yeah, yeah. He, paid, yeah. he ended up. But not attorney's fees. The law was not in place. There was no yet. attorney fees then. Yeah, I, I think I could have gotten attorney fees if I pushed it, but, but I, th I think that. I've, I've, for probably eight years, I've filed these cases and haven't taken a dime in attorney fees. But I'm, it's kind of like Robert Steinbuck said, you know, at some point you got to show them that you're, and, and we did that with, with Fayetteville. Uh, in this uh, uh, matter against the school board uh, or school district, you know, they, they him hog around and, and our, our client had filed this FOIA request regarding critical race theory. Uh, they said it was overbroad and uh, using the buzzwords in FOIA. So we just drafted a, a, a FOIA request and they did the same thing. So we just filed a lawsuit, and we got 8,500 records uh, 
a week or two after, very similar to your situation. And then they want to argue that 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 uh, we weren't entitled to attorney fees. It, it's been, and we're kind of going through that that battle right now uh, with them. It's they say, well, when we plugged in the words, we got we got hits. Uh, we got six hundred thousand hits. Well, we're not asking about hits. We're asking about <laughs> records. And and so I guess they their argument is is we didn't uh, substantially. I think the the buzzwords are substantially prevail. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous, but but I think I think you've just got to show that you mean business. You know, you, you, that's the bottom line. And sometimes it it requires a lawsuit, and sometimes they immediately comply. Uh, you know, Fayetteville wanted to play hardball. They want to say, well, we didn't violate for you. Well, you know, we had to file a lawsuit to get 8,500 records. So the judge found that they did uh, violate for you. His specific ruling was is that they did not provide the record within three working days. They did that twice, in effect. Uh, I'm a big believer in, you know, give them time. Uh, be reasonable about it. If they say they need, hey, we need uh, till next week, okay, that's fine. You know, just give me a date certain that you think, and if something happens and you can't get them by then, that's fine also. Because what we don't want to do is be so unreasonable that the legislature thinks that they're going to have to take it up to, to expand the time. Because I can tell you back in 2017, we came with that close to losing the, the three working days. Uh, in fact, I testified on that, and I mean, it, it was, they had cut a, a deal had been cut between both sides. And it was really, to me, it was really disturbing. I was the only one who testified. For some unknown reason to me, the committee, uh, they couldn't get, they didn't get a second. But it, it was like, you know, just what I said. I mean, three working days. It's our records. We own the records. Uh, if it, it's customary that most people are reasonable, if you need two weeks, we give you two weeks. Uh, but sometimes... Sometimes it's kind of time sensitive, so the three working days is, is important. Dr. Lewis, I think you're up here. Uh, did Jim, did you finish, you didn't finish uh, after, after Jim. Uh, you didn't say anything about, well, you have to some degree. What about George Prince and Hot Springs? You've not got Hot Springs yet. <clears throat> Well, I often get accused of speaking too long, but I'll try to make it short so that we're we're not here too long, too much longer anyway. You know, after sitting here all day and hearing Dr. Steinbeck and hearing everyone, I'm trying to think about why do we need FOIA? I did learn today that as government increases, the need for FOIA increases. I, did, I learned today, it appeared to me, came to my senses, that every government body that exists, from those governing bodies like Jim was talking about in Bella Vista, let's talk about the government agencies that are funded by public money, our tax money. The school board doesn't want you to know what they're doing, so they go immediately in Hot Springs to executive session as soon as you ask them a question. And when they come out, they don't even bother to tell you what it was. Now, you gotta pick your battles carefully, and our group over in Hot Springs is small. Russ Thomas couldn't be here today, and Renee Westfall just took a new job, and she couldn't be here. Uh, I'm, call, I'm called Bulldog sometimes, because I complain all the time. I think that's why I'm called Bulldog, and I'm proud to be a Bulldog. Uh, Russ is the brains of the organization. I'm his partner, and I'm the mouthpiece. And Renee's the one we use because she has a relationship that somehow she can go to our city and our county and ask for things and it doesn't make them angry. When I go, I just make them angry when I get there. So uh, I was once, as I went into a city meeting, I was asked, was I going to speak today? And I said, well, yes, I am to, to, to my, my representative. But he looked at me and he looked down and he says, full manure. I just had to clear that up. 
Uh, need for FOIA. The more government increases, the larger a government body gets, the larger the agency gets, the more FOIA we need. It's a simple reason. The more you get together, the more you do, the more that you're trying to do, the more you're trying to hide. They're trying to hide it. I asked Representative Lowry there after Joey defined meeting. You can't have a meeting if there's only one of you. You can't do it. If there's more than one of you, you can have a meeting. All meetings are two or more. His answer was, think about this now. His answer was, well, we were able to achieve this by getting together and we worked this out. Unfortunately, when they did that, here's what they did to the public. They put the blinders on, they worked it out. When I voted in the voting booth, I didn't vote for anybody to go work it out. I voted for them to go up there and represent what they presented to us when they campaigned. That was, what do you want, what do you think? My, my senator says, I don't care what you think, I'm gonna do what I want because I was voted to be your representative and it doesn't matter what you think. Now that's Bill Sample over in Hot Springs, okay? Now, that's just not right, but ironically, while he says that, there's a lot of good things that Bill does, and he, he, he does do some things, and, and, and they turn out right, but sometimes I think they turn out right by accident. So I, I just wanna say that our goal should always be with FOIA to point out that we want honest, open, visible. We want it always in the light of day. We're looking for the best result. We're not like looking for the best negotiated settlement that we're all uh, going to be happy with. Because what you happen with when you get a compromise, you know, if your wife wants to redecorate your house and you don't want to spend the $30,000 or $50,000 and you agree that you'll let her to redo the master bedroom, that's a compromise. You're not happy with your money you spent, and she's not happy that the house wasn't all done. That's what you get when you have a compromise. I don't want my representatives compromising. We had FOI, a, a great success in Hot Springs, it was something to do with the math and science school, and it had to do particularly with they were pushing an agenda of an LBTQ. LBGQ and the rest of the alphabet agenda. Uh, it turned out after we had our meeting and after we had a large group of people gathered together, some of the evidence that was presented to us that made us take this on turned out to be not quite so true. It left a little leg on our face, but we fought it until then and then we had to concede. And we did win some with, the, some with it and we did lose some with it. I've been I, I haven't paid for any lawsuits like the colonel here has. But I have been the, the plaintiff in a number of lawsuits in Hot Springs because they said, we need somebody that lives in the city that doesn't mind if, they, if we use you to be the plaintiff. Mm -hmm. I've won some, I've lost some. But I will tell you what they always do, they neuter you after you win. And we went to the meeting, we won the right on public comment. When we sat down after the meeting, we went out and, you know, we had a little imbibed a little bit and congratulated ourselves. And we went back to the next meeting. And at the next meeting, they passed another ordinance that just neutered all the results of what we won. And we didn't have the public comment section televised anymore, but we could still have it. If you can't be heard, is there any point in speaking? So, anyway... Our group's very small in Hot Springs. We're active. We pick something. We try to pick carefully what we're going to do. Uh, we've had a lot of success as a result of several organizations, but FOIA has been our latest one and it's made a system. We've all worked with a good government go group. We've worked with Tea Party. We've worked with AFP. AFP taught us a lot how to as we've learned in FOIA how to. Thank you, Joey, we've learned a lot. We are to the point that when we ask the city for something, we get it. When we ask the county for something, we get it. We learned that we don't want to ask for too much. 
Because if you get too much, you have to analyze too much. That's a lot of work for a few people. Uh, we probably have eight or ten people that participate with us at any time on a project. We have three to five that are active in things that are ongoing. Uh, I show up here today because I'm the one that doesn't have a job. All the others have jobs. So anyway, thank you, Joy. I'm, I'm going to make the closing comments. That's all about Hot Springs. Thank you, Joy. That good-looking guy over there, over there in that, that patriotic shirt, I thank him. I will tell you that we've had more conversations on the phone. The length of our time on the phone is about twice the length of the time of this meeting today from the beginning until the time we all get in the cars to drive home. I thank all those that spoke. I very, I very much enjoyed your prosecutor's view, sir. I, I've never heard any heard someone give something like that. I'm glad you're here so I can thank you personally because that was a, that was very enlightening to me. Uh, I try to stay out of courtrooms. I try to stay out of, I try to stay out of the new jail we built over in Hot Springs. And I'll close with uh, one of the things that's really funny. I was a guy in Hot Springs that raised the most opposition to the new jail in Hot Springs. It wasn't about the jail. It was about the money and how much they was going to spend. And um, I still get to laugh at every one of them because on the plaque dedicating the new jail, I was a JP at the time that it was done and I'm on that plaque. And I remind them all, yes, and I'm the guy that fought it all the way. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. And I think uh, we're going to have a benediction here, but I hope that we're successful with this. We can do it again. And hopefully the legislators will not be in session on the time we do it so we can have more here. All right. You've got to pray, man. We got to leave without you praying. I'm going to make a statement or two before. He's going to talk about, my, right. he's going to talk about yeah. my good looks. I know what he's going to do. <laughs> Are you coming up, going to come up here, Dr. Lewis? I will say this, uh, George. I've always admired you. You have a great voice. And uh, I, I really think you should have been a radio announcer, television star, or something like that. But, I admire you very much. I, I love to hear you speak. I don't know what it is about you. You're not as good looking as I am, but I, I love to hear you speak. Thank you. And uh, George, I enjoyed your comments too, Jim. There's two things I'd like to, to make everybody aware of if you don't know it, and our listeners or our viewers maybe will, will know about this too. It's very handy. There are two laws in Arkansas. I wish we could get every agency public agency to have both, all of them have to have these two laws. With school boards, and that's where most of my experience is, is 47 years as an educator. In school boards, Dan, and I bet you know this, Dan, if the board will not let you speak to them, if they will not put you on their agenda to maybe get some information or listen to some things or speak, then there is a way under the law, under the law, to force that school board to meet. All you have to do, and if you know of somebody, uh, they want to call me, I've got a petition that we put together. If you get 50 signatures of 50 voters in that school district, they've, all, they've got to be in your school district where you're applying to, to talk to the board, you can force that board to meet. There's an attorney general's opinion or two on that, that they have to meet in a reasonable length of time also. They can't just pussyfoot around and put things off. So if, if you're, you're talking about school boards, I'd love to be able, George, to get this for every public agency where if they wouldn't let you talk at the city council meeting, you could force them to meet. If they wouldn't let you call, talk to at the court board, you could force them to meet. But right now, as far as I know, it only pertains to school boards. Number two, and this has been mentioned a little bit today, Quorum courts that I've had some experience with in talking to people, there is one law that, that matches their status also, and that is they must allow the public, those people who are attending the meeting, to make a public, to make a comment before the final decision is made on every issue where a decision is called for. So if you're in a meeting, and our, our quorum court, I think, is, is maybe still doing this, and personally, I think it's wrong. 
they wait in, on their agenda to the very end, as a rule, and put public comments there. Right? That's wrong. They should not. They're really, I think, they're really sort of deviating around the intent of what the law is. I think what a quorum court should do is in every area on the agenda where there's to be a decision made, they should state after that, if it's, if it's item number one on the agenda, then they should say public comments as per and then cite the number of the law. That puts everything above board. But those two things, we, we really need to have something like that too geared to all public agencies, not just to the court court or not just to the school board. Two or three things I'd like to mention about what we've done in Harrison. And I'd like to again call everybody's attention to the website of the Arkansas Transparency and Government Group, arctig.com, arctig.com, you've got it back here. If you will look at that, you'll see several things that that we have done in the Harrison, the Harrison uh, TIG, TIG group. One thing in particular, we had a call come two or three years ago from a gentleman who was a teacher coach in a neighboring school district. The superintendent in that district had written a letter to him stating that he was going to have him terminated. This is where the FOIA comes in. So we looked into that situation we took about 16 people, people plus a videographer to the school board meeting. And, but before that, we found out through one of our members writing an FOIA request, the superintendent had said that this particular teacher had missed too many days. So we had one of our members of our TIG group write a FOIA request asking for the number of days that every staff member in that district missed because of personal leave, health reasons, or professional leave. The superintendent says, no, I'm not gonna to respond to that. We're not gonna tell anything about uh, sick leave or anything like that. We wrote the superintendent back a letter, same person wrote it back to him, stating we don't want to know the reason they were absent because of health. We want to know, were they on the job? Were they at school? We, we sent an attorney general's opinion also that backed that up, I think. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, they had the hearing, and because of our action as a group, Jim, we were able to get the board to not, not abide by that. There was, a, there was a lawsuit, I think, that happened and I think the, the instructor basically finally won in the long run. We also had a situation where a football coach was going to be terminated. And here it again involves an attorney general's opinion. Now, I'm a big believer in if you're, on the, if you're on the attorney general's side, if you're on that opinion side, and we've been told this by the AG's office several years ago, you're gonna win 99% of your cases. If Joy Parsons represents a plaintiff and that plaintiff is backed up by an AG opinion, I'll bet my house that he's going to win. Not just because he's Joy Parsons, or rather he's, he's uh, Joy McCutcheon, but just because he's late good. Today. He's late good. Today. But I'm, I'm saying that he's going to win. His client's going to win 90% of the time. And, but anyway, we had a situation where the superintendent wanted to have the hearing under the law in a very small, I think a room, uh, in library conference room or something. We told that superintendent, I did, by letter, certified letter, that we expect 150 people to be there. <laughs> and I think you'll find under the law and under the AG opinions that if that person, the, the head of that organization, if they're advised that, you know, this, this meeting area may not be big enough, you probably need to have a bigger area. And bless his heart, he relented and did allow us to go into a large, very nicely furnished high school auditorium, cafeteria. 
We had 146 people there, I believe, Jim. There's no way in the world we would have been able to do that in this small. But, but that's basically using the law in our favor, using the law like it should be used. And so ultimately, also, the board refused to terminate that football coach. And so that's, that's just, I've always found in my career, Elizabeth, that knowledge of the law gives you a lot of confidence, gives you a lot of, call it power, I don't know what it calls, strength, but it gives you, it gives you a lot of, it gives you a position. You're, you're in a better position if you know the law. You walk, if Liz walks into a, uh, Elizabeth walks into a, a, an office and she says, I'd like to have this, and the first thing that someone may say to her, what do you want it for? Your comment would be what? None of your business. <laughs> None of your business. You don't have they to tell them what. That. Now, I have seen, I saw a water board one time in a neighboring county, water association board, have a, have a requester fill out a whole sheet of, of answers, you know. What are you going to do with it? Uh, who told you to come here and get it? Uh, all kinds no. of things. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. Joy, let me make one other fine, final comment. On this sheet here, if you'll take a, take a look at this, we owe a great deal of gratitude to Kevin back here for helping us put this website yeah. together. We owe a, I don't, I don't usually take much advice from Colonel Parsons. He's younger than I am. But he did introduce me to this gentleman back here with the headphones. And Jim, I'm very thankful that you did that. And Kevin, I'm very thankful that he's decided to join with us. He is great. If you'll look through this, and again, go on our, go on our website, arctic.com. You'll find, uh, and I hope I'm calling this correctly because I don't know quite as much technology as you do, Kevin. Kevin. But you'll see about 20, 22, 23 pages. Mm -hmm. This website is really uh, a uh, birthing process right now. We're not probably near done with it. We'll be changing it some. We'll be adding some to it as, as time permits and as the need arises. But you'll see these things on here. And one of these days, uh, Dan, quite frankly, if you'll look down through here, I think there's a section on prosecuting attorneys. I hope to goodness that we can have your, your name on here sometime as a fellow who is knowledgeable about FOIA, passionate about FOIA, and is not going to put up with any crap for people who violate FOIA. I hope we'll have his name on there sometime. But take a look at that, and, 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 and Kevin, we owe you a great deal of gratitude for putting all this together. He's been an expert at doing this. I think all of our members realize that now. Uh, he was a total stranger to all of us except Jim. And I don't usually, as I said earlier, rely much on Jim's advice, but by golly, the next time you recommend somebody to me, I'm going to take your advice. Thanks. Hey, Bill Ray, you stay up here. Come here. Uh, I want to thank Bill Ray Lewis. He is... You said you, said you would kiss me first. <laughs> no, I didn't say that, and I won't. But I may. I may, because I love you. Because, and I'm, I, I don't say that lightly. I love you. You are, you are a, a great man and a great patriot, and you're a great friend. And, did, and did, I, Joy, did, did, did Jim Parsons tell you to say that? Yes, he did. And I love Jim Parsons, too, <laughs> for, the same, too. for the same reasons. But... I want to say, if you look at on the table, the the agenda, the the, the thing, for the handbook, the, all the I don't know what's happening here, but uh, but the, the the free books. I mean, Bill Ray has worked tirelessly to put this on, uh, and I appreciate that so much, and we all do. And and I think of the 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 story about the. Uh, the shellfish that, uh, not the shellfish, but the, that the walking on the beach oh, and there's yeah, a bunch yeah, of yeah, them yeah. and they're, huh? Starfish. Starfish, Starfish. Yeah. Starfish. Starfish. And, and, yeah. you know, there's a ton of them and one of them's thrown back. So, you know, 
hey, we're making a difference. It may be in small ways sometimes, but we're, we're making a difference. And, and I think that's important. We make a difference by what we did today. It may not change the world, but, but it's important. And I want to say one more thing. Uh, why I, I'm thankful for you. <laughs> because he, he kept asking me to come over to Harrison, and I'd go over and I would speak, and he kept telling me that, there was this, as he would say, only he can say, you've heard it a thousand times today, you know, you're the best looking person I know. And, and he kept telling me about this blonde lady uh, that I needed to meet. And every time I'd go over there, she wouldn't show up. And I'm like, Bill Ray, you're making this person up. So finally, uh, we met. And anyway, long story short, he, uh, he introduced me to my new wife. And, uh, and uh, we're both very happy. And, and this is a thank you from Shirley and I to you, Bill Ray. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. And we, we appreciate you. Uh -oh. So uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. A great day. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, I've got to say thank you. Well, thank you. I, I have never met. I, I know I've got a decent to lawyer over we here. We, we I, I've got a decent to lawyer in Fedville. I've had, I've had a lot of personal friends all my career who have been attorneys. But I've never worked with anybody quite like this guy right here. Uh, knowledgeable, passionate. He not only knows the law and works the law, but he also has, and Jim and I know this, a great deal of respect for the social aspect of life, of helping people. And, and boy, that, that puts him aside and way out beyond a lot of people that I have known. You're a great too. Thank you. Appreciate everybody coming. Thank you. Very good. Are you? You know the one thing. Appreciate you. Yeah.